Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the satellite session presenting the research breakthroughs of the next generation of scientific leaders. I am Monica Perez Temprano, group leader at the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia, ICQ, located in Tarragona, and, and today I will be the moderator of this flash talk session. As part of the 2021 BIS conference, in the next one hour and a half, talented previs and provis fellows located in different BIS centers will show us how they are currently pushing the frontiers of different scientific disciplines. These pre- and postdoctoral programs are led by the Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology, BIST, and funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Today, we have a terrific lineup of speakers, five pro postdoctoral fellows, uh, Claudia Patricia Valdés from the Institute of Photonic Sciences, uh, Valentin uh, Maffei from the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia, Maria de la Cruz Cardeñosa from the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Technology and Nanotechnology, Pablo Sánchez Puertas from the High Energy Physics Institute, uh, Thomas Mortimer from the Institute of Research in, in Biomedicine, and two previous PhD fellows, uh, Craig, Dever, uh, Craig Day from ICQ and Clara Borras from IRB. The dynamic of this session will be made in the following manner. The speaker will have around eight minutes to present their works and at the end of the session we will have time for question and answer from the, uh, from the audience that are right now uh, is connected by YouTube. So please post your question and specify the speaker to who you direct your comment. Now it's time to start with the first speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Uh, Claudia Patricia Valdez. Claudia studied physics at the Univ uh, Universidad del Valle in Colombia where she continued with a, a master degree in the area of optics between uh, 2011 and 2014, she completed her PhD at the Institute of Photonics uh, Sciences, ICFO, uh, in Barcelona, in the Medicinal Optics Group, developing a new technique for imaging deep blood flow. In 2015, she returned to her uh, home country, where she worked as an imaging specialist in microscopy with the Nikon distributor in Colombia. Uh, at the same time, she participated in a research project with the Optical Radiology Lab in Washington University. And in uh, 2019, she returned to Barcelona uh, to, to ICFO as a Provis Fellow in the Super Resolution Optical Microscopy and nano Nanoscopy uh, Group to participate in the development of a multimodal device to obtain high resolution images of the retina. She's going to present us her talk entitled uh, Building the Tools to Embed the Retina in High Detail. So please, uh, Claudia, the, the screen is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for, for the invitation. And uh, yes, well, I will present what we have been doing during these, these years. And uh, well, we are really interested, why we are interested in the retina. The retina, it's a system that is very important because, uh, well, nowadays there are some diseases that are, are pathologies that may cause blindness and can affect uh, some, uh, some uh, population in the, in the working ages. So also another important thing about the retina is that it's part of the central nervous system. So we can see the eye as a window to our central nervous system. The retina is a complex system composed of several layers, as you can see here. And uh, since we are interested in, well, it would be really nice to be able to see these uh, different layers of the retina to get some information. So we are interested in developing a nice device that may give us a lot of information with several techniques that may allow us to uh, uh, give some support into the prevention, the diagnosis, and also following up the diseases in the eye, in the retina especially. So uh, in the beginning, we are interested in seeing the cones and the roads, so the morphology of the retina, uh, because this, uh, if we can check these uh, cells, we are going to be able to follow up how the disease is, is going over time, for example. And right now, uh, it's not well. It's not possible to check in the with the with the current devices. It's not possible to check or to arrive to these uh, high de high resolution images that are able to give us information about the morphology of the retina. So what we are doing, 
we are based, we are starting with a device that is a scanning laser, a scanning light ophthalmoscope. Uh, this device is based in a, uh, it's like a confocal microscope, but instead of having an objective like in the normal microscopes, what we are doing is replacing, let's say, the objective by the lenses that we have in the eye. So this scanning laser ophthalmoscope it allows us to have some optical sectioning of the eye, which allows us to go into the different details of the, ret the layers of the retina. Also allows us to have a 2D scanning system so we can get an image and uh, we can have images like the one that we have in here. Uh, moreover, as I told before, we are interested in seeing the, at the cellular, to get images at the cellular level. So we have uh, adapted a technique into the, this SLO uh, device, which is uh, adaptive optics. And this technique is used by the astronomists to improve the images of the stars. Because when the, the light comes uh, through the atmosphere, these images got uh, distorted. So what we are doing is to add this technique into the device. And with this, we are able to get images like the, ones with, the one we have in the right side that in which we can define the cones the, and the roads of the of the retina. Sorry. OK, so the first thing that we, we did was, uh, well, test this device. We have already tested this device. We are also working with a, with a company in France in a European project as well. And we have been able to test this device in, in some human subjects and obtaining the images at the right with the high resolution. Also, with in this device, the thing that is interesting is that we uh, have uh, introduced a retinal tracker that has two, two options or two, two jobs to do here in the device. So the first one is to be able to, uh, to correlate, to co-localize the images in real time. And the second one, so we can get nice images like the one in here with the details for the for the for the cones and the roads in the retina and the other uh, work that it could do is that it could guide for example other devices like the like an oct that we also have in the device and uh, if the retinal tracker is not in there we could have images like this one but once the retinal tracker is added to the device we have corrected images in which we can see the details uh, with the oct image Mm, we also have modified this device to uh, obtain images from small animals. And we have these are preliminary results of uh, small animal experiments in vivo. And this one is the SLO view, in which we can uh, see the optic disc and we can see some vessels. And in the back, we can see the retina. Also, we have some preliminary results with the adaptive optics, but this is something that we are doing right now. Okay, so uh, what's what's next? So we are we in the group. We have some experience before uh, doing this adaptive optics, but as you can see, we have these adaptive optics normally are done in devices that are huge and that cannot be moved into the clinical uh, setup. So what we have done is that we have com compact this device, and nowadays with the company that we are working on. Uh, in the, the result of the, the European project is a device that looks like the one that is in the in the right hand side. Also, what we are what's next for us, as I told you and as I mentioned, we would like to have a device that is like the like the Swiss Army knife would say, in which we have several techniques that may allow us to get more as much information as we want from the from the eye for the clinicians that are interested in obtaining this information. So Right now, as I mentioned, we have a device that is based on the scanning laser of Thomascope. We have added adaptive optics. Now we have the retinal tracker and we are thinking, we also have uh, the device that with the company has also OCT right now. And what's next, we want to add some Raman spectroscopy because this with add uh, will give us some information, uh, for example, about cancer in the eye or about neuroinflammation as well. 
and we want to add to photon microscopy, which is a technique that may allow us to uh, see, for example, the uh, uh, nervous impulses if we uh, of the of the cells. Uh, we are going to continue uh, adding these techniques, so it's going to look like something like this, but with light. And the important thing is that we are uh, doing a device that is not invasive and will give us a lot of information to start understanding the retina. And these images that I showed you before have unprecedented information for the clinicians. And also, in the meantime, since we are also adapting it to uh, seeing animal retinas, we can uh, benefit the preclinical studies and also the, uh, the clinical stage for understanding the, the retina. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks, Claudia, for a fantastic talk. Really, really interesting. And now is the time for Valentin Maffei. Valentin received his PhD in 2018 under the supervision of Dr. Thomas Gustafson in Paris, Eclate, France, on the effect on second fluorescence sense of complete uh, dyes, uh, sensitized solar cells using organic dyes as photosensitizers. In early 2019, he joined the group of Dr. Elizabeth Romero at ISCQ, and later the same year, uh, he was awarded with one of the Provis Fellowship. His project is focused on the design and characterization of charge separating units uh, using state-of-the-art result spectroscopic techniques. And today, Valentin is going to present a, a flash talk entitled Blasting Your Way uh, Through Bad Kinetics to Achieve Efficient Photoconversion, Quantum Efficient in Biology. So, Valentin, the, the screen is yours. You are muted, Valentin. Can you? Oh, yeah, Sorry. better? This yes, way? fantastic. Thank you. No, I, I was just thanking you for the kind introduction. Um, so I entitled my talk uh, Quantum Effect in Biology, but let me first begin by apologizing about the, this title because I chose it to be eye catchy. Of course, there is numerical biological effects that fall out of the classical description, especially in photosynthesis. And, Today, I just wanted to highlight two of them that we are trying to implement in artificial photosystem. So a better title would be something like that. So these two processes I will talk about are for faster energy transfer so that photoconversion can be achieved um, before any detrimental process occur. Um, because efficiency is just a ratio of kinetics, they have a reason why photosystem is so good as achieving photoconversion. First one I want to talk about is rather simple. In a lot of natural proteins involving light absorption or energy transfer, like light harvesting complex two here, uh, pigments are arranged to have strong orbital interaction leading to delocalized exciter states or the so-called excitants. And in LH2, for example, you have two rings of pigments with two large excitonic entities, which are crucial for two reasons. Uh, first, they increase the numbers of photons absorbed as excitants lead to larger and shifted absorption bands. But that's not so interesting um, to produce artificial photosystems because well, in general, humans tend to have access to a larger library of pigments, so we can have different absorption and, uh, and cross absorption with different pigments. So it's, that, that property is not so interesting for us. But more importantly, they actually decrease the energy loss because uh, energy is transported faster with the, uh, using the excitons. You have extremely fast migration from one cluster or one complex from to another, and also from locally excited state to excited state. And because the energy is final efficiency from light of complex toward the central unit of the reaction center, the energy, um, you have a good efficiency just because the efficiency transport is faster than any kind of recombination. And in the reaction center, the, where the energy absorbed, which was until now stored as molecular excited state, um, and that will be used to separate charges, which will then be used for oxidation of water, for example. Um, so let's take, for example, for system two reaction center here. Um, you have another process who might be uh, responsible for fastening charge separation, uh, which is vibrant coherence. The importance of this effect for the photosynthesis is still discussed, but it can be described when two electronic states, um, when two electronic states are um, mixing because the, an, intra an intramolecular vibration is in resonance with the difference of zero phonon energy of the two states. Right. It, it's actually simpler than it sounds. So let's say I have this uh, energy surface here for the excited state with two wells corresponding to two excited states. One will be my excitant and the other my 
exacerbated state. I, I basically have two, two cases. The non reason case where the difference in energy is something and something that is not equal to a, a vibrational level. And the reason case where this uh, difference in energy is exactly like a, a vibrational mode. And in this first case, which is an unreason case, the wave function is located into one of the uh, one of its cluster states. But the states are mixed when you have resonance, and this allows for extremely fast energy transfer from one local minima to the other. And in this case, from the excitant to a chassis process state. For example, in, in PS2AC, this is thought to speed up the charge separation from a few picoseconds to a few hundreds of femtoseconds, which is extremely important because this is faster than recombination, so you have efficient uh, charge separation because you have fast kinetics. So for, for, for uh, PS2AC, uh, the exitonic state that is uh, be between the closed field D1 and the field fit in D1 is in resonance uh, with the... Um, charge price state localized on the same um, pairs of, chromo of chromophores due to an intramocular um, vibration, which is 340 centimeters minus one, which is a, a classic mode for the chlorophyll uh, ring. So this effect has been measured, uh, but it's still a discussion of how do you, if it has an effect in the photosynthesis, if it's that useful or not. And it's actually hard to prove or disprove because even if you could make a mutant uh, and show a slower charge separation, you won't get a definitive proof until you, you build the entire plant or the entire bacteria and you see that it performs worse at photoconversion. And even then, you, it will be hard to disprove that the mutation you did had no other effect than on the vibrational coherence. So it's actually hard to discuss this phenomena. Our approach is a bit different because for artificial photosystems, anyway, a faster charge separation will always be a good thing. So. We want a system where we can control the energy level of the excited state, and that can be modified so that we, uh, we can modify the energy so that we can turn on and off the, uh, the resonance. And we want to study the impact of this vibration coherence on, on the uh, kinetics of the energy transfer. So because the vibrational modes anyway depends on the pigments, we cannot really change them easily. So we need a tunable environment or a smart matrix. And the, the choice that was made in, in our group is to use artificial protein. Here's an example of uh, one of the artificial, artificial protein that we use. It's a 132 residue alpha helix uh, bundle for, with four alpha helix. And it's able to house um, two or four uh, zinc chlorophyll derivative. So we designed the binding pockets to obtain the desired interactions between the chromophore to get the desired excitonic level. And then we do point mutation to change the energy level. And that's how we get this on-off switch for vibrational coherence. Then we need um, a method to measure these kinetics. And well, this, these kinetics are extremely fast. We are talking about the femtosecond or picosecond time range. And because of the design, we are dealing with strongly absorbent materials. So time user spectroscopy is the tool to study those system. And specifically two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy which brings a, a direct observation of how different exciter states or system are coupled. Think of it uh, for, for chemists in the audience as uh, two, what, what is the difference between one DNMR and two DNMR. You will directly have a coupling between the, the sites and here between the uh, exciter states. It is an extremely complex experiment to run though. Um, you need to have perfectly uh, characterized pulses uh, compressed to sub 15 femtosecond level or um, coming together a new sample and because of that, this method is actually not so uh, common in, a, in the lab. So we developed uh, an expertise on that, and we are using it to study all the novo samples, or the novo proteins. And also, we are still using it to uh, look for more quantum bits in natural sources system, because we are still trying to answer, um, looking for, also for common quantum, ecology, quantum biology question, like why is the coherence uh, observed so long, and does it play a, a role in photosynthesis? Uh, with that, I uh, finished my talk and I just wanted to, to show you a picture of all the people that actually work in our group here, uh, starting with our group leader, Elisabeth Romero, and, uh, uh, and also thank you for the funding and including my, my previous fellowship. Thank you. Thanks, Valentin, for a really nice talk. Uh, and now is the time for our next speaker, Maria de la Cruz Cardeñosa. Uh, Maria finished her bachelor degree at the University of Salamanca in 2013. After that, 
she enrolled in the Erasmus Mundus Master in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology that took place in Belgium and France. Uh, in 2014, she got a fellowship from La Caixa to carry out her PhD thesis at the University of Michigan uh, in the United States under the supervision of Professor Ryan Bailey. So probably we crossed paths because we, I was exactly at the same time in the same place. So that I, when I checked your CV, that was, that was fun to see. Uh, and Maria Corley uh, is a provost postdoctoral researcher at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology and uh, ICN2 in the group of Professor uh, Laura Lechuga. And her current work is focused on the development of uh, photonic biosensor devices for the detection of diseases bio, of disease biomarkers in clinical analysis. The title of her talk is Silicon Photonic Biosensor for the New Generation of Clinical Diagnosis. So, Maria, the, the screen is yours. You are muted too. <laughs> You are still muted. No, we cannot listen to you. Okay. Now perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. So thanks again for the introduction. So as uh, she told us, I'm going to be talking about the silico photonic biosensors for clinical diagnostics. So I'm a provost postdoctoral researcher at the Nanobiosensors a Bio Bioanalytical Applications Group directed by Laura Lechuga at the ICN2 in, Be in Bellaterra. So let's talk first. Maybe you already know how like conventional diagnostics are done. So usually, I mean, we go to the nurse and we go to the doctor and they take samples. Usually they take like a, you know, like a, around five milliliters of blood or, mean, or my, you might give them urine or other kind of samples. Yeah, usually they need to be processed by very like professional staffs and maybe they need to be sent to centralized labs. So they, they are not like analyzing the same cup. And then sometimes they take like a couple of days or maybe weeks in order to get your results analyzed. But when we are talking in biosensor-based diagnostics, we are referring to um, these biosensors that can be integrated in point-of-care platforms that can be used in the moment. So they usually require like, like a smaller amount of samples of blood, of urine, or maybe tears. And then you must be just required like a less than one milliliter. And then uh, the idea of these platforms will be like, they will be very easy to use and very straightforward. So anybody can do it, even the, the same patient or maybe the doctor in the, in the moment of the, like you are going to the hospital. And then for sure, like you will be having like real time results, results at the same moment you are measuring or maybe short time results. In less than one day, you can have your results. So that would be the idea of having this biosensor based point of care platform. But what are biosensors? I mean, maybe you already know them. So they are devices that can like measure any kind of analyte and they are very sensitive because they exploit the recognition that by bioreceptors or biomolecules that can be like antibodies, can be like DNA strands, enzymes, or other kind of biomolecules. So in here, I mean, you can like very easily like I hope understand the pictures. We will have our sample with the biomarkers from the disease that we want to detect. Then we have our biosensor device. In the biosensor on the surface, we will attach our bioreceptors. And then this bioreceptor will recognize selectively the uh, biomarkers on the samples. Then when this bio recognition event happens, uh, the transducer will be able to like trans translate this signal into an electronic signal. And then we can have the, the readout signal into a screen that we can easily understand, like if there is a binding event or not. Maybe you already know some point of care platforms that are based on biosensor. Maybe you already know the glucose meter. So inside of the glucose meter, we have a biosensor that is based on a glucose enzyme that is able to recognize the glucose and then produce an electrochemical reactions. And then we can have the readout of how much glucose is in our blood. In our uh, lab, we work in something similar. It's not an electrochemical sensor like this one. We work with optical sensor that they are based on silicon. So why silicon? Because silicon has very nice optical properties. They, they can like, uh, as you, you know, they are able, maybe you don't know, uh, 
silicon in, can like if we made uh, web guides made of silicon they can like couple the light and and conduct the, the light in you know in the path that we want so uh, we fabricate these sensors in this sensor we have like 20 web guides so in this web guides we can couple the bioreceptors of the molecules that we want to recognize they can be dna they can be antibodies then on these web guides we will be coupling the light from a laser beam and then there will be a recognition event and then here the light the properties of the light will change and then we have a photo detector that we will tell us how much the change the light has changed and then we can relate that to the amount of biomarkers that they are binding to the surface so i mean this uh, sensor the principle behind the working of sorry the working principle of this sensor is this evanescent film so when the light is coupled there is an evanescent film that uh, leak a little bit on the surface about 200 nanometers and then it's like proving or sensing what is happening on the surface right so some advantages of this silicon photonic biosensor is that they are label free so they don't depend on fluorescence or any change in the color i mean so we don't need to like modify the molecules in order to see what is happening on the surface they are very sensitive why because of this evanescent field that i told you about because it's just is measuring what's happening just at the surface and not in in the whole space so they just can recognize like like a few molecules binding on the surface because of this high sensitivity. So they are miniaturized. These they are not very large. So we can incorporate these chips inside of like platform like I saw you before the glucose meter, and so we can make these portable devices that to be transported into a hospital, into the house of the patient, or maybe in the in the field. In addition, they are low cost and they can be like mass produced because they are made of silicon. So we can use the semiconductor fabrication techniques in order to make like a lot of chips in the same wafer of silicon. So here you can see a video very fast, like how they work. So we bind the bioreceptors, then the 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 analytes that they, they they get recognized by these bioreceptors here you have like the waveguide so the light will be coupled the light of a laser beam will be coupled here on the waveguide you can see now and then depending on the amount of biomarkers that they are bound the properties of the light will change in our case they are interferometers so they will produce an interference pattern that will change depending on how much molecules are bound one of the projects I'm working right now is like an European, it's an European project, uh, like three countries participating. So we're working in the brain trauma monitoring. So when brain trauma happens, there are a lot of effects that can happen in our brain. For example, we can have some inflammation biomarkers coming from astrocytes. And also like neurons, we break um, from the leakage of this neuron cytoskeleton. We have neurofilaments that we go to our blood. So by measure, and as well as other like neurotrophic factors, when this like brain is rehabilitating, uh, maybe changes in the RNA. So right now we are working in making a device that is able to measure like different biomarkers related with inflammation, like uh, neuronal damage and changes in RNA expression. And we're measuring the samples at different times to see how the patients are evolving and how much is the damage and as well how the treatments are affecting to those patients. So I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. This is my group directed by uh, Professor Laura Lechuga. And I mean, we are working in so many applications that I cannot describe all of them right now. And this is at the ICN2. Okay, thanks so much for your attention. Hi, congrats, Marie Cruz. Really, really nice talk. Now is the time for Pablo Sanchez Puertas. Uh, Pablo carried out his bachelor and master degrees at the University of Granada. Next, he moved, he moved to Germany, where he did his PhD in hydronic physics at Mainz University. Subsequently, he had a postdoctoral position at Charles University in the Czech Republic, where he studied the electromagnetic interaction 
of neutral pseudo scalar mesons. And currently, he's a provost fellow in the theory division at the High Energy Physics Institute at the University of Tomana Autonoma of, uh, of Barcelona. He's working in hydronic physics, especially with emphasis on precision on new physics searches. And his talk is entitled Unveiling the Pion Bradley. So, Pablo, the, the screen is yours. Hello, thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so in this talk, I will, I will describe how to unveil the pion radii, which is based on this work with these uh, two collaborators. So, first of all, I should introduce the pion. So, probably all of you are familiar to protons and neutrons. Uh, so, protons and neutrons bind together to make nuclei, and together with the electrons, make all of the elements in the periodic table. Now, uh, the proton and the neutrons are not elementary particles, so it's not something like point-like, but we know they are made of some smaller elementary particles that we call quarks, which are these uh, tiny dots here. Uh, in particular, there are two kinds of quarks making protons and neutrons that we call for historic reason up and down quarks. They have very similar masses and different ch electric charges. So the up quark has charge two thirds and the down one has charge minus one third with the corresponding antiquark having opposite charge but same mass. Now, it turns out that when you have quarks, you can make other particles that are not only protons and neutrons with three quarks. For instance, you can create uh, mesons that have a quark and an antiquark. The simplest example uh, are the pions, which are 10 times lighter in that protons and neutrons, and we can create in experiments. Uh, and for instance, this one is made of an up quark with charge two thirds and an anti down quark with charge one third. So it has a total charge of plus one. This is the positively charged pion, and we also have the negatively charged pion or, or the neutral one. And in this study, we wanted to better understand the, the inner structure of these particles, okay, of the quarks inside the, the pions. <clears throat> so in order to understand what we do, it's quite useful to have some uh, classical analogy, even if it's not perfect. So imagine uh, a binary system. Uh, so you can have different possibilities. Imagine the situation in which one of the objects, say our down quark, will be extremely heavy, and the lighter object, say the up quark, will be very light, like the sun and the earth, for instance. Then essentially one will sit at the middle and the other will orbit around at a given radius. It will be a situation like this one on the left. On the other hand, if they have the same mass, they essentially will resemble the right uh, situation here, where two objects uh, circle around the center of mass uh, at the same radius, let's say. So this will be the other extreme situation. But in general, if, they, if their masses are not equal or the difference is not huge, the situation will be something in the middle. So one will be orbiting, say, around a larger radius and the other at a small one. And actually, we know the quark masses are different, so we know it must be somewhere uh, in here. So the point in this study is, okay, can we distinguish uh, quark mass effects in these uh, distributions of the quarks inside the pions? So this is extremely hard from first principles, say, to solve uh, our equations, but it is possible we have been doing for ages to use experiments. Now, it, it was very difficult to make difference of the up and down quark, but the novel thing in our study is to show that there is a way to use available experimental data to find this, this difference. So before doing that, let me tell you how do we measure the structure of the particles. Essentially, we follow Rutherford's idea to unveil the structure of the atom, which is as follows. Imagine you have some target that you want to know about, like this big ball in the middle. So then you bomb with some let's say. This is called a scattering experiment. And then you look behind and look at the pattern that you observed. And probably here, all of you can infer the, sh the shape and the size of this object. So basically, this is the idea. But in colliders, say we have el electrons, we can have the pions. And the electrons produce a lot of photons, which are our ballets, and then the pion will be our target. So we are heating photons of a pion. And from the, from the pattern that we see, essentially, uh, we can infer properties of it. So how this works is 
uh, basically, heuristically, we can explain this way. Imagine you have a very low energy collision. The photons have a small energy then. And this means that the photon wavelength will be quite large. And then it only sees the pions as a whole. It cannot access the inner, the inner structure. It cannot access its features, which are smaller than its wavelength. Now, if you have very high energy collisions, that's why we like to have high energy colliders, among other things, then you have high energy photons with shorter wavelengths, and you can access the, the inner structure of the pions. Essentially, you are only sensitive to a small portion of the, of the pion charge. And um, actually, then the number of events uh, decreases or the scattering is, is less than when you have lower energies, let's say. And all this information that I described with words, uh, you can extract in, ex in scattering experiments and it's encapsulated in a function called form factor. And uh, let's say this one. Uh, and this variable is the energy of the collision. And for instance, when the energy is very small, it gives you the charge. And its change with energy tells you about the structure of the particles. For instance, the radius is related to the derivative of that function. So we have been used this for ages to, to understand the structure of the particles. Now, the problem is that with photons, we are only sensitive to the charge distribution. So the photon doesn't care about the name of the quark or its mass. It only cares about the charge. So it's difficult really to make a difference of the up and the down quark inside the pion. Now, the strategy that we use, it's a simple trick, but it works very good. We can re-express this as two different charge distribution where they have the same charge and opposite charge. And the funny thing about the last one is that will this radii, the up and down quark, be the same? This will vanish because this will overlap and cancel perfectly. And if not, uh, um, if the associated form factor does not vanish, it means that the radius are different. And the nice idea of punchline in the article was to realize that a non-vanishing form factor is related to some phenomenon known from a long time ago called raw mega mixing, which is related to this dip in, this, uh, in the form factor. So using a suitable parametrization, we could access uh, this form factor. Um, from the electromagnetic form factor, the radius, the charge radius of the pion was known. We could now uh, find the difference of the radius for the up and down quark inside the pion. And combining with this information, we can see that the up quark, which is lighter, is more extended than the down quark, which stays, let's say, at inner distances within the pion. Uh, so this is the first estimate of this uh, different radio that has been obtained for the first time. And it provides an important benchmark for future models and calculations with supercomputers. Um, with that, I'm done. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thanks, Pablo, for the really inspiring talk. Uh, now is uh, the time for our last Provis Fellow, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Mortimer. Thomas obtained his master's degree in biochemistry at Oxford University in 2014. In 2000, his PhD degrees from the Francis Crick Institute in London and the supervision of Dr. Paola Scafidi. And currently, he's working at the Institute of Research in Biomedicine, IRB, in Barcelona, in the research group of Dr. Salvador Agnar, focused on steep cell and cancer. And his project aims to uncover the mechanism that enable coordinated circadian regulation of organismal uh, physiology. The title of his talk is The Constructing Systemic Coordination of circadian clocks and their role in optimizing organismal fitness. Uh, Thomas, the screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just going to try and share this full screen um, now. Uh, one second. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I do that. It's, for some reason, it's got me just part of the screen and I can't move through it. Um, Sorry, could you give me a hand to so I could share this the screen? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, Marta, are you there? Oh, uh, uh, five uh, uh, F five might work. 
just Pablo said. So try F5. Now I lost Thomas. Yeah, we have lost Thomas. Um, okay. Okay, he's here. Sorry. Sorry, I'm back. Sorry. So try again to share the screen and maybe. Okay, so we So if we go to share window, ah, maybe if I go to share entire screen. And then here, can you see me now? I can see you, but not the screen. <laughs> okay. Um, now I see your, no, now I, I saw your screen for a few seconds, but <laughs> they, it now did disappear. Okay, give me one second. See try it, try it again, Thomas, try it again. So if I share screen and I go share screen and then I select the window I want to share, which is the presentation. So it should be sharing it now. Yes, but it's not in presenting mode. No. And now, can you see it in presenting mode? No, not me at this. Okay, I'm not quite sure why this is happening. Um, so it won't let me, I, I can't access or change anything with the screen that's being shared at the moment. Um, maybe you can continue with the uh, PowerPoint like this. Wait a second, let me, yeah, because this, this, this way I can't actually move through the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, yeah, Valentina just said that you are sharing the PowerPoint window. Yeah. Uh, and the... you need to share the full screen window. Okay, share the full screen window. And how do I do that? Sorry. <laughs> or share the entire screen. Um, I'm sorry, Thomas, but we are in a short time. So maybe. Okay, move on to the next one and then I can try and fix the problem, maybe. Whatever, like uh, Marta, you, whatever you want. Uh, we can move to the next one. Marta, are you uh, okay with that? No, no, it, it worked. Okay. Oh, we, we, we moved to Craig or not, Marta? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, if, if Thomas wants to share the screen, so I think it's sharing the screen now. Um, yes. Let's do a, a last try. Okay. And then so you put it on full, on full screen mode. In full screen mode like this. Perfect. Yes, you have Perfect. it. Okay. okay, like this, Perfect. yes. Okay, yes. and you can see the full screen. Fantastic. Yes, okay, <laughs> brilliant. Well, sorry, sorry for the technical issues. <laughs> um, and thank you, yeah, thank you, Monica, for the introduction, uh, nonetheless. And sorry for taking up so much time with that. Um, so today, I want to uh, sort of give you a, a brief outline of the sort of work we're doing in the lab, and then kind of tease at the end with um, a few of the results which we've been uh, collecting recently. So I want to start with uh, this famous photo, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this view. But here, I don't want you to focus on uh, Gaudi's masterpiece. What I want you to focus on is the difference between Barcelona by day and Barcelona by night. And it only takes a, a short walk through El Raval at night to appreciate that Barcelona is a very different city by day than by night. Now, when we think more generally, what this represents is that there are very general and predictable changes in environmental conditions that happen between day and night. And these are uh, changes which are experienced by uh, all living organisms on Earth. Now, these predictable changes in environmental conditions can take the form of changes in temperature, changes in food ability, uh, change in uh, the presence of UV radiation or the presence of predators. And what this significant signifies for life forms on Earth is that they must adapt in a, uh, they must adapt to these uh, daily changes in the environmental conditions uh, that they experience. And so you know, what do these adaptations look like uh, in the case of humans? And so here I've just taken a classic diagram which shows a few of the changes which we experience in our biology over the 24-hour light-dark cycle. So for example, uh, you know, the average human is at their most alert at 10 a.m. in the morning. The average person is at their strongest at 5 p.m. in the afternoon and at, in their deepest sleep at 2 a.m. in the morning. And so the question is, how is it that um, you know, humans and other life forms achieve this adaptation to this rhythmically changing environment within which we live? 
And so it turns out that the answer is through the use of molecular clocks. And so I well, definitely don't have the time now to go into all the details of how these function, but to suffice to say that in almost all cell types inside of your body, there is a molecular clock which ticks with a 24 hour rhythm. And as an output, this clock drives a range of different rhythmic processes that allows us to adapt to our changing environment. Now, like all good clocks, the clock is only useful if it is aligned to all other clocks. And exactly the same is the case with the clocks that we find within our body. They're only useful if they're aligned to each other. And this alignment in the case of the clocks in our body is achieved by um, signals which come from a master clock located within the brain. And this master clock uh, receives signals from light which come in through the eye and then converts these light signals into neural and humoral cues which can align the clocks found throughout the body, allowing us to have an aligned, synchronized kind of daily physiology which enables us to adapt to this changing environment. Now, fascinatingly, at least for me and for us in the lab, it's been recently demonstrated that not only is there this top-down control of this broad network of clocks by the master clock, but also there's a lot of crosstalk between the clocks found in different tissues throughout the body. And so what do I mean by crosstalk between the different clocks? What I mean here is that signals that come from the muscle determine the rhythmic processes which happen in the skin or the intestine or the liver and vice versa. Now, interestingly, other evidence has demonstrated that these kind of rhythmic processes which we carry out every single day become disrupted during aging and also uh, by a number of different disease states such as um, eating a high fat diet, high fat western diet, uh, cancer, to name but a few. However, despite the uh, apparent importance of this intricate network of clocks which governs uh, the daily rhythms we undertake to maintain our health, um, we actually know very, very little about the structure of this clock network. And so we in the lab set out to understand better how this uh, clock network is formed, uh, what are the most important parts, and how exactly is it affected during different disease states. Now, uh, to do this, we decided to turn to uh, mouse genetics to allow us to tinker with this uh, intricate system of clocks to better understand how it works. And what we've done is to start effectively from a situation in which we've removed all the clocks. We've removed all the clocks from the body, in this case, of a mouse. And then what we do is piece by piece, we put back these clocks in different tissues, enabling us to understand how those uh, individual clocks work in isolation and how they talk to each other, creating what we've kind of termed a minimal clock network. Now, just to talk in, in more specifics exactly what that means, here, what we've been generating recently is animals where, for example, the clock is only active within the brain, sort of exploring what functions that control. Other animals in which the clock is active only in the skin, because this is our favorite tissue and it has a, a really strong uh, biology, biology, which varies on a day with a daily rhythm. And finally, we've created animals in which the clock is present both in the brain and in the skin. Now, this may seem slightly obscure and, and sort of, you know, kind of it's not, might not be clear to you why we do this, but what we want to understand here is how that clock that's located in the brain is talking to the clock in the skin. Understanding how the signals which are emanating from that clock in the brain are controlling what your skin does on a daily basis. And it turns out your skin does quite a lot on a daily basis. It, it divides, it replicates its DNA, it repairs DNA, all with very predictable rhythms, all at very predictable times of day. And what we want to understand is how other parts of your body can dictate exactly when that is happening. Now, for the real aficionados, as I mentioned, here is a little bit of data related to that. So what we've done here is we've extracted the top layer of the skin of the mice, sequenced uh, what's called RNA. In fact, I suppose the whole world is much more familiar with what RNA now is, given uh, what COVID has done for us. Um, and then what we do is we identify those genes which are, sort of, uh, which are created, um, sort of created and sort of um, broken down with a sort of a daily rhythm. And then we perform a degree of comparisons against these different uh, conditions we've created, the one, uh, the mouse in which the clock is only in the skin, only in the brain, and in both, to then explore you know, the, the, which processes these different types of communication are important. And here, uh, to sort of cut a long story short, what we found is that although this uh, 
crosstalk, this conversation between the clock in the brain and the skin is incredibly important. It turns out that actually what's more important is inputs from other clocks in this broader network, suggesting that actually you know, signals that come from the liver have as much to do with the daily sort of uh, changes in the biology of the skin as signals coming from this so-called master clock in the brain. And we think this gives a really interesting and novel insight into how the sort of daily biology of humans, which is so crucial to our health, um, is actually regulated. And we believe that this understanding of how the system works can then give us the power to start to understand how disease conditions come about and potentially develop um, pharmaceutical um, interventions for the future. So I just want to thank, uh, thank everyone for listening and apologize once again for the uh, technical issues at the beginning. Thanks, Thomas, for the really nice talk. Now is the turn of the Previs Fellow. Uh, first, uh, Craig Day will present his work. Craig obtained his bachelor's degree in pharmaceutical and biological chemistry from York University and his master's degree in chemistry from the University of, of Ottawa. Uh, since 2019, he's holding a Previs uh, Fellowship to carry out his PhD thesis at the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia under the supervision of uh, Ruben Martin. His research is focused on unraveling key mechanistic intricacies associated to catalytic transformation involving a nickel-based catalyst. The title of his talk is Chemistry's Leading Catalytic Transformations. Uh, Craig, the, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Monica. Uh, hopefully this works. You guys get it full screen? Not yet. I think that you need to put in, in, in... I have the same problem. Okay, I'll change back. We don't see now. Okay. Uh, now, uh, now it's everything. Uh, we see your normal PowerPoint screen. We don't see the full screen. So I guess that, yes, you have to go there. Yes. I, uh, yeah. it, it, it seems like it's delayed. Is, is it full now? Now we see the um, divide. Now, yes. Yes. OK. Yeah. OK. So perfect. Uh, yeah. So. so uh, thank you, Monica, for the introduction. And so today I'll be presenting some of the work we had published in Nature Catalysis uh, earlier this year, um, in which we studied the mechanism of nickel catalyzed Nagishi cross couplings of aryl esters. And so, as chemists, we like to synthesize molecules. And as an example, is this uh, toxic alkaloid found in frog skin uh, shown here. And if you were to devise a synthesis, you can imagine. Uh, to forge uh, this carbon-carbon bond from a disconnection. And one of the most commonly used disconnections is a Nagishi cross-coupling, which takes an organo-zinc reagent and uh, an organic halide using a palladium catalyst, and you're able to join these two fragments together uh, to then give you this desired compound. And the importance of this transformation was recognized in 2010 with the Nobel Prize uh, given in part to uh, Nikishi. Now, as modern synthetic chemists, we aim to uh, perform sustainable catalysis. And so palladium is a quite expensive and scarce transition metal. And so as chemists, we aim to find more abundant and cheaper alternatives. And so in that, we looked, uh, and Rubin's group looks towards nickel catalysis as uh, a cheap and abundant and sustainable alternative to more traditional uh, and historic reactions. Alternatively, we have looked to bring in uh, new chemical feedstocks, more sustainable feedstocks, uh, to move away from a lot of, let's say, petroleum products. And in these products or in these waste streams, lignin is a very attractive uh, alternative. And this comes from wood and plants. And so you can take uh, what would be historically waste and turn them into value added products such as, let's say, pharmaceuticals. And an area we found particularly interesting is in the activation of phenols. These are incredibly abundant uh, and often cheap feedstock chemicals, 
but the direct activation is quite challenging due to the strong uh, carbon-oxygen bond shown here, and so traditionally they're quite inert. But chemists have found a way to activate phenols and turn them into aryl esters, which weakens the CO bond and allows for further divertization that would otherwise be impossible, bringing in uh, new chemical feedstocks that would be previously inaccessible. Some examples of phenols are just shown below, uh, and you can see they're incredibly abundant in uh, biological molecules. So the example we based our study off of was this Nagishi cross-coupling developed by the Shi lab in 2008, in which they first reported taking these aryl esters and an organozinc reagent using nickel catalysis, and they're able to join these two fragments together uh, to form value-added products. The mechanism they proposed is one that's slightly conical in which you have oxidative addition from a low valent metal center. This cleaves the CO bond and forms two fragments. Then the unwanted fragment is exchanged in a uh, Nagisi transmetallation to form a bis ligated nickel complex, which then undergoes reductive elimination to form the value added product and regenerate your catalyst. Some of the utility of this transformation is shown here on the right, in which you're able to take relatively simple precursors and through this Nagishi cross-coupling of aryl esters form much more valuable products. Now to start our investigation, we looked at the first step, which was unexplored at this point, and found that oxidative addition with nickel zero indeed does cleave this CO bond. We're able to identify two species that are formed uh, 5A and 5A prime, which are interrelated by uh, the binding hapticity of their carboxylate ligand, either kappa-2 or kappa-1, in which you're able to unambiguously determine this by X-ray diffraction with the crystal structures shown here in the bottom. We also identify that these complexes undergo comproportionation. Uh, basically, the starting nickel complex reacts with the oxidative addition complex formed to give you this bimetallic uh, intermediate, which is uh, we believe to be off-cycle, which we're also able to characterize by X-ray crystallography in 6A. What we then looked at was repeating these same reactions, but in the presence of zinc dichloride, which is abundant in uh, chemistry and in particularly uh, uh, Nagishi cross-coupling reactions. And interestingly, what we see is that in the presence of zinc dichloride, there's no reaction, that the pr previous reactivity does not occur. Instead, what we see is that you have primarily oxidation of nickel from nickel zero to nickel one, and the formation of these nickel zinc clusters. Now, this is important because this was the first evidence uh, in the literature of this type of redox interaction between nickel and zinc, and also the first evidence of these nickel zinc clusters that could form uh, from intermetallic uh, reactions between nickel zero and zinc two, which were important more generally than just the system we were studying. From this, we turned to studying the catalytic transformation and in doing so, we first performed a Hammond analysis in which we get a straight linear line uh, consistent with the first step of oxidative addition uh, being rate determining in catalysis. What we then uh, looked at was solvent effects for this transformation. And what we find is that the standard catalytic conditions using THF DMA did work uh, quite well. But if you remove DMA, which is a toxic kind of unwanted uh, solvent, often accompanied in nickel transformations, uh, the reactivity is uh, stopped. Basically, you, you, you get no desired product or very little. However, what we believe then was the role of DMA was acting as a ligand to bind the zinc and disrupt this cluster formation and redox interactions that we had previously noted. And so what we then believed is that you could replace the solvent use of uh, DMA with just a stoichiometric amount of a very cheap and sacrificial ligand. So in this case, we use just stoichiometric additions of pyridine and we were able to restore catalytic activity. And so together, this brings very fundamental principles in understanding the reasons for why something happens uh, and finding solutions to these problems uh, to develop new catalytic transformations that are now much more, uh, let's say, 
friendly to industrial adoption. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. I thank uh, Ruben Martin for his support during this and the Martin Group, and of course the BIS for organizing this uh, event and for the funding of this project. Congrats, great, beautiful chemistry. Uh, now is the time for our last speaker of the session, Clara Borras. Clara studied uh, biomedical, uh, bio, biomedical science at the University of Barcelona, uh, finishing her studies, performing an Erasmus stay uh, in the University of Amsterdam. She stayed in the Netherlands to perform a two-year master in cancer stem cells and devel developmental biology at the University of Utrecht. Before starting his PhD, he decided to merge her artistic and scientific passion and carry out a postgraduate degree in scientific illustration in the University of, of the Basque Country, but I think that is awesome. And currently, she's a previous fellow at the Institute of Research of Biomedicine, IRB, in the field of oncology and immunity in the group of Dr. Angel Nebrada. Her talk is entitled Function of P38A signaling in anti tumor immune response. Clara, the screen is yours. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen as well. I hope you can see it nice. Perfect. Great. Thank you for the nice introduction, Monica. So, indeed, today I'm going to talk about my PhD project, which I'm doing here in the IRB Barcelona in the lab of Dr. Angel Nebreda. And the project is basically trying to make this connection between molecular stress and lung immunity. So our main focus is the lung uh, tumors, which I'm going to explain you a little bit now. So uh, tumors are these um, uh, masses that form in, in tissues and are basically uh, dividing cells that take the space of the normal tissue and the nutrients that these that this tissue might have, right? So uh, tumor cells have a lot of different characteristics that I'm just depicting here in this beautiful graph. Um, we can just uh, state some of them, like for instance, sustained proliferation. So these cells have this ability of actually dividing a lot, no? They have a lot of other characteristics, like for instance, uh, angiogenesis, which is um, the way that they do to uptake nutrients, no? So they form these new blood vessels to have a lot of nutrients to actually grow and grow and grow, no? So all these characteristics make these tumor cells uh, very different from the healthy cells uh, of the normal tissue, right? And these uh, differences are not uh, unseen by our immune system, no? It, it's very an, a very intelligent system that sees these differences and actually get activated by these uh, cancer cells. No? So I'm just putting you here a beautiful image by electron microscopy of a cancer cell that we can see here in the background and a T lymphocytes that are these uh, beautiful uh, round cells that are trying to attack this cancer cell and kill it. So the main um, idea that we have to take from, from this is that the immune system gets activated by cancers and tries to fight this disease uh, very nicely, you know? So immune system is not an abstract concept, it's actually cells doing stuff, you no? Know? So we have a lot of cells in our body trying to, to fight against this disease, and uh, in the case uh, that a cancer arises, also cancer, you no? Know? So there is a lot of different cells in the immune system, but uh, today, just to simplify the concept, we can just say that there is two very important types of uh, immune cells, no? myeloid cells and lymphoid cells. And all these cells are trying to fight against cancers if they, if they arise. Um, so if this was working perfectly, of course, cancers wouldn't be there, right? So if the immune system was working nicely and cancers were detected, we wouldn't have uh, these cancers, right? So there has to be some kind of trick here that is happening. So amongst all these characteristics that I've uh, just stated in the beginning, there is one that I want to highlight, that is uh, immune evasion. So cancers have the ability of escaping these immune attacks. And one of the main mechanisms in which how they do this is by sending signals to these uh, immune cells to corrupt, to make them bad, 
and not um, and not being seen by them. No, so so kind of being transparent to the immune system, and that's what we are studying in in the lab. No, we are studying specifically this this uh, myeloid cells to see how they are uh, helping the tumor to to grow further. So uh, just to follow up the introduction a little bit more, if we were to look inside of a, of a normal cell in, in the body, we would find that it's not an empty space, no? Uh, cells are full of proteins that are, like in this uh, beautiful representation, they are highlighted in, this, uh, in these colors. So uh, proteins are actually the little entities that do the function in the cells. So in, in our lab, in the lab of Angel Nebreda, we are studying a particular protein that is P38-alpha. But just for you to, to understand a bit what it does, it's basically a protein that uptakes a cellular stress messages and just gives a cellular response. So it's a very important protein in all the cells of our body. Um, so we are studying how this could be important in, in, lung, in lung tumors, right? So the way to study this, is basically um, by using mouse models, no? Uh, tumors are studied in, in mouse, and especially the immune system, no? I, there's a lot of cells playing a role here, so we have to use mouse models. So in a normal mouse, we have that all the cells of the body have P38 inside them. Also in the immune system, the lymphoid cells and the myeloid cells will have P38 inside, inside, their, inside them, no? Uh, we are using a genetically engineered uh, mouse model in which we have removed uh, P38 protein specifically in myeloid cells. So we will have that in this mice, all cells have P38 except myeloid cells. So that's how we can infer what happens, uh, what does it do P38 in this, in this, in these cells, no? So using these, um, these mouse models, what we do is induce lung tumors to this mouse, and after a certain time point, we observe the tumor formation, which is this um, black uh, dot in this in this lung. We observe the differences between normal mouse and the mouse that we have removed this protein. So we put this uh, this lung tissues in in a microscopy slides, and we basically we basically observe uh, in a more detailed way what happens. No. We can observe here, this is the lung normal tissue, this area here, and all these uh, purple masses are the tumors that are formated in these animals. So if we compare it to the P38 removed from myeloid cell animals, what we observe is a huge reduction in the number of, of tumor formation. No? So in this, what this is telling us is that this protein, in particularly these cells, is playing a role in the tumor formation in these animals. So not only this, we have also observed some other stuff that I'm just gonna show you very quickly, a very interesting observation. So what we have done as well is in this uh, beautiful slide, we have looked for this uh, killer T lymphocytes that I showed you in the beginning to see how were they in these in this, in this lags, no? So in a normal mouse, here we can see the normal uh, lung, and this would be the tumor. So we can see that this CD8 uh, cell, which are these killer T lymphocytes, we can observe some of them that are kind of trying to fight against this, against this tumor, right? So if now we look at the animals where we have removed P38 from the myeloid cells, we can observe that in the tumoral mass, which would be all these areas, we observe that the number of killer T cells is super, super increased in comparison with a normal mouse. So in this case, we are seeing that when we remove P38 from myeloid cells in these animals, the immune system is more active and trying to kill more these tumors. And that's maybe why we see less tumorogenesis in these animals. So just to finish some two uh, last sentences, so we have observed that removing P38 from these myeloid cells decreases lung metastasis, and in a more therapeutical way, we could target uh, P38 in these in these conditions as a potential therapy for uh, lung metastasis. And with this, I would like to finish thanking my my whole lab and all of you for for listening. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Clara. Really, really nice talk. Now. 
it's time for questions. I really encourage all our audience to post uh, questions uh, via YouTube. Uh, I am now because so far they have been shy. Indeed, uh, the question that is on the chat is from one of our speakers, uh, Valentin, to, to Thomas. So Valentin said, uh, hey, Thomas, thank you for the nice talk. In practice, how do you suppress, remove a particular clock? Also, what is the nature of the signal you mentioned? Uh, are they uh, the same for every clock? Yeah, sure. So with regard to the, the first part of the question, so what we do there is, I don't know how much you know about mouse genetics, but effectively we have the gene, um, a gene of a protein called BMAL1. And this is one of the main constituents of this clock that I talked about. And so what we do here is we, genetic, is we genetically modify the gene. We insert what's called a stop codon, something that prevents that gene from being made. But the clever trick here is that we flank that, uh, that stop codon with what's called LOXP sites. And what's really nice about those is that what we can do is we can, get a, we can express another protein which effectively chops out that stop site and reactivates this key component of the clock. And using that, we can effectively turn on in a, in a tissue selective manner uh, this clock. And so that's effectively the trick we've been using to uh, sort of you know, suppress uh, or to, to activate, in this case, the clock within specific tissues. Um, in terms of the signals, yeah, so this is the million dollar question, really. So what exactly are the signals which are used in the communication between these different clocks? And so in the case of the master clock communicating with other clocks of the body, this is relatively well established that this occurs through the sympathetic nervous system and also through hormones such as glucocorticoids. Um, it's also hypothesized that there are other elements such as actually the physical movement of the animal, temperature changes which can also contribute. But really what those signals are, going between those peripheral clocks, that is the million dollar question for us that we'd really love to answer here and something we're trying to probe using this model. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, we have other question from Elena Redondo. Congrats on your talks. Which one do you think would be the next revolution in each one of your fields? Pretty sure you and your life will be surely involved. So I don't know if we can start uh, by topics or just uh, you appear in my screen. So for example, Clara, what do you think is going to be the next revolution in your field? Uh, am I muted? No. No, we can listen to you. Um, yeah, well, I'm just thinking now that, um, so I've just given you a little introduction on no? Yes? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think this is a bit delayed. Sorry. Um, so I've just given you a little bit of an introduction on what immunotherapies are, no? So some of these, these therapies are really working on patients, but there's still this caveat of patients that don't really respond. So that's a little bit my project is, is there, no? To try to find how to make these immunotherapies to work again. So, um, the breakthrough would be to actually find this, this way of making immunotherapies work. And uh, that would be really, really good in, in the field of cancer therapies, definitely. Valentin, you are the next in my screen, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I was trying to think what is my field, because sometimes I don't know if I'm a biologist, uh, ultra-fast uh, uh, spectroscopist or anything like that. All right, so in terms of um, proteins for photoconversion systems, I think I think the next breakthrough will probably be a self-repaired protein. Like if someone can obtain the problem of making a catalyst is that at some point the catalyst just died. But plants manage to actually repair the proteins. So that will be, I think, the next breakthrough that I hope will, will happen because that will be extremely interesting then to have artificial photosystem to, to to, prove, to do um, solar fuels. In, in spectroscopy, uh, um, not, not so sure, not so sure what will, what will be the next breakthrough. At also one spectroscopy is definitely there, but I'm not sure it's actually useful for to answer a clinical question. So now I think we, we have all the tools needed, but maybe uh, maybe we'll become more uh, available to, to uh, people soon and that will be the, the next breakthrough when actually biologists can uh, use uh, thermal spectroscopy really easily without developing collaboration without uh, just uh, just know just perfectly understanding. that will be the, the next breakthrough i guess thermal spectroscopy complete uh, popularization thanks valentin great what do you think is the next revolution 
in your I don't know if you will will see organometallic chemistry mechanism synthesis catalysis yeah sure I, 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 I think it's maybe one of what academics see as valuable and what is industrially maybe valuable or, or applicable in that like I, I think a lot of what academics do doesn't translate to the real world it, it, I, I think that the that's a gap that still really needs to be filled, particularly with what a lot of people are working on, which is, is very common now is in first row uh, transition metal catalysis. Uh, almost all of it is very unrealistic in, in the catalyst loadings and the substrates used. And I, I think that's the, the next significant step. It, it's to actually translate that technology into what will be uh, useful for, for the world. And, and I, I think that's something that's still quite a bit away, but I think hopefully in the next 10 years, we can maybe actually realize, uh, which would be, yeah, I, I think a big step. I hope because both of us, we are working on that. So <laughs> I hope that. Uh, so thanks, Greg. Uh, Pablo, what do you think is the next revolution in your field? Hello. Well, it's hard to say it's quite a speculative thing, right? Uh, also working on particles and hadronic physics. Um, well, what we are trying to search is for new physics because we have reasons to, to think that we there are new forces or particles in nature. Uh, but let's say make our theory more aesthetically pleasant, so to say. And at present there are, for instance, uh, some we call anomalies, I mean, some measurements that are not within our expectations. Um, on one side, it comes from uh, some meson decays, not the pions, some heavier mesons with heavier quark, the V mesons. Um, it turns out that what we observe is not exactly what we will expect. So it might be that there are additional forces that are responsible for this. Uh, but we need uh, to have better measurements with more statistics, so we have to wait for that. And also, for instance, uh, something I've been working on is also a precise measurement, which is the anomalous magnetic moment of the mean that we can measure very precise, and also we can we can predict very precisely. So there is at the moment an experiment which is running. So we already some data was analyzed, some anomaly was confirmed, but still we need more statistics. But that experiment is running on, so so we will achieve the, the required statistics. But also the theory side has to improve, and yeah, hopefully there are some things we need to better understand. So hopefully in the future this will be clarified, and we will see if these anomalies persist. If they do, that's interesting. If not, uh, yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> it means we understand things much better than we expected. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, Marie Cruz, what do you think that is, an, is the next revolution in your field? Well, I, I believe that the next revolution in my field in clinical diagnostics and in general in monitoring like any kind of diseases already happening, like we can see already like a, like a smartwatch and anything like is wearable, like we are starting like having like devices that can measure like biomarkers like already like, like in us. I mean, the, the idea would be also to have this kind of devices also in hospitals and kind of replace the ones that we already have. But I mean, we still, the, there is a, still a lot of like work in order to validate these devices so they can be used in the clinic. But I believe the, the revolution is already happening with all the wearable devices to measure like any kind of biomarker. So. So the revolution is already here. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. I mean, the idea would be like, uh, we also have like our devices, like they are really like integrated and portable, but we are still like working on prototypes. But I mean, the idea would be like to have these prototypes and take it to the place or maybe like make it like wearable so you can measure like all the time, whatever you want to measure. So Thomas, um, what about you? What do you think? I suppose so in my field we we sequence we do a lot of sequencing and, and sequencing has come a very 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 long way 
over the last you know, 20 years or so, we've gone from a situation in which the human genome was a project of billions of dollars and, and multiple labs, all the way to a situation in which you know, anyone with a tiny laboratory can sequence the life out of whatever they fancy. However, the great problem with a lot of this is with basically what we're doing is taking samples from a living organism, smashing them to pieces, and then in, in sort of interrogating the biology. And so what I feel would be the sort of the next development, I suppose, kind of ties in with Mari Cruz's work in a way, is these sort of biosensors, the ability to take a living organism and to analyze at a single cell level what's happening in real time. Because that, at least in my field, would be amazing in terms of what we could discover and what we could sort of say about circadian biology using sort of sensors like that. So I suppose it's a future that's a long way off, but I think it's inevitable we'll arrive there at some point. But it's true that now with bioinformatics, like uh, the, the, the amount of data that you can handle at the same time is, is insane. So I, I can imagine that uh, doing what you want to do like 20 years ago, it would be <laughs> way more complicated. Oh, exactly. So, uh, yeah, it, I think in my project alone, we have sequenced more than the entire, well, I mean, it would have cost, I think if you did it in 2000, it would have cost you probably on the scale of the entire gross domestic product of Spain. So, I mean, you, you know, it's amazing really the sort of the change that's been undergone in such a short period of time. Um, and yeah, and bioinformatics is, I mean, <laughs> hence the shortage of bioinformaticians in, in Barcelona. <laughs> it's, it's, it's growing and it's only going to keep on getting bigger. No, no, like you are in the right place in the right moment. So I'm sure that you are going to do really amazing things. Claudia is not there, I guess. Uh, I don't see her. So uh, with uh, Elena's uh, question, you answer some of the question that I, I wrote down, but I had a question for Marie Cruz and, and for Claudia, if Claudia can connect again, that uh, because both of you, uh, your, your talk was based on the development of a device. So what is your plan for transferring your technology to the market? So do you have, is, is how realistic is to have your uh, own research out there in a reasonable amount of time or is, is already it's like is, is is already happening so are you already uh, have a prototype that in the sense that can have a, like a five ten year uh, a scale to be out okay i mean it's not my, I mean, the device that we use is not only mine. I mean, it's my boss device. So I guess like uh, during her period, like the whole, her whole career, she like already like a star, like different companies um, for the one that we have right now, maybe in the future. I mean, we are right now, we are validating it with the different application, but the prototype has been already like patented. So I guess like uh, when she has like, Several, several, you know, several applications um, validated with different studies. She, she can like start another company with it. So something that she has been doing, and maybe she will probably do with this device. So no, because like your your application, like in, in general, um, all of you have like have a really uh, can make a really impact in in in, in a while yeah. really basis life. But uh, you and Claudia, you present something that like it really is like you you can have in, in, in your hand. You know what I mean? So I was curious yeah. about how how was the if, if you have a, a, a market plan. I mean, <laughs> I mean, not, not not in my case. Like uh, I probably I don't know what I'm gonna do next. But <laughs> I'm not thinking in starting a company. Yeah, but the idea will be you know that with this research, I mean, you can start like a company and and so on um yeah so, but th that would be the idea you know <laughs> like you have like nice results and then you start like uh, making a prototype in order to yeah to to show in front of investors and and then start a company with it i mean it's the case of many people like working on silicon sensors and other kind of biosensors they have like my boss in, in the United States, uh, I was working also with the uh, uh, silicon photonic sensors. Uh, it was a company behind all, all of this. So it's very feasible that we translate this into the market. So I hope that that happened because uh, it's, it's a really uh, amazing technology. So it's close to five. Uh, so I think that is time for wrap up the, the session. I would like to thank all of you, so Clara, Valentin, Craig, Pablo, Maricruz, Thomas, and Claudia for your amazing talk. Uh, we can see here that you are really the leader of the, of, of 
the future. And I, I, I'm very sure that uh, we are going to hear a lot from you and the research that you are going to do in the, in the next year. I would also like to thank all the audience that uh, join us via YouTube. I hope that you enjoyed the session and also all the BIS community, Adela, Marta, Elena, for helping us to put together the, the session. Uh, I hope that the next time this can be in person and we can uh, come back a little bit to the normal life. So thanks again to all of you and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.